Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are, whenever you may be listening. This is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two. Episode number 18, this season is now old enough to vote, but not quite old enough to drink, thankfully. We got a few more episodes before it reaches drinking age, but I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge, and as always, I am happy to be with you. You can interact with the podcast in a number of different ways. You can visit our website at talkingaudiobooks.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash talkingaudiobooks and Twitter at twitter.com slash talkingaudio. I am Audiobook Casey. That's Audiobook C-A-S-E-Y on Facebook, Twitter, and Goodreads. I'm always happy to connect with listeners of the podcast and audiobook fans in general say hello i will follow back and i will respond love talking to people on social media you can find each new episode of the talking audiobooks podcast on our website talkingaudiobooks.com or you can subscribe and get each new episode when it becomes available on itunes soundcloud stitcher spreaker tune in radio iHeartRadio. Google Play Music, YouTube, and with our RSS feed, which you can find at our website, you can manually add that to any podcast aggregator of your choice, and you can listen to the show whenever and however you want to listen to it. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. We have a very fun episode of the Talking Audiobooks podcast for you this week. I sit down with audiobook narrator Helen Lloyd for an interview, and this is a really good interview. Helen is a British audiobook narrator, the first British audiobook narrator I've had the pleasure of interviewing on the podcast, and that's actually the first thing we talk about is how the audiobook industry is different in the UK as compared to here in the United States. I have a listener base all over the world, but it's primarily here in the US. You know, Americans sometimes think that the way things work in America is how they work all over the place or the trajectory is the same for an industry across the world as it is for America. And that's not true at all and definitely not true in audiobooks. So Helen and I talk about that for a while. We talk about her acting career, being on television, and then just a lot of audiobook talk and you know her preparation, working with Sean Pratt, who you have heard on this podcast before. And if you haven't heard that episode previously, I suggest you go back into the archives and check it out. It's a very good episode. But don't do that until after you've heard my interview with Helen, because she is a lot of fun. And it was so good to talk to her, like talking to an old friend about a subject you both love. And that is true here for audiobooks. And uh, we'll be featuring some of her clips in the interview as well. And it is going to be a good interview. And we even talk about desserts at the end. And it does make sense that we would talk about desserts at the end. I promise. And this is sort of a lengthy interview, so I don't think I should delay it any further. 
So after this break, after this message from Ken, we will go to the interview that I recorded with Helen Lloyd talking all about her audiobook narration career and a bunch of other interesting topics. So here's Ken, and after that, we'll be back with Helen Lloyd on the Talking Audiobooks podcast. The September Talking Audiobooks podcast giveaway is on. And now we've added a way for you to increase your chance to win. Just go to the website, talkingaudiobooks.com. On the right side, click on September Giveaway, and you can enter to win four free audiobooks from audible.com. But wait, there's more. Now you can add up to seven additional entries to increase your chance of winning. You can earn bonus entries by visiting our website, liking Talking Audiobooks on Facebook, sharing us on Facebook, following us on Twitter, sharing us on Twitter, sharing us on Google. But wait, there's more. Now, new with the September giveaway, you can earn an additional entry for every friend you invite to join the drawing with you. No purchase necessary. All you have to do is enter. Void where prohibited by law, but who would want to prohibit you from winning four free audiobooks from Audible? Enter today. Get your friends to enter. Get your entries in by noon on September 28th. A winner will be randomly drawn from everyone who enters. Good luck. back and as promised we have audiobook narrator Helen Lloyd with us on the line. Helen, how are you doing today? I'm extremely well, thank you, Casey. It's sort of ooh, six o'clock in the afternoon here in the UK, so I've got a slight time difference. So I'm heading into my evening and it's been a good day. It's been a very good day. Um and all is well. Thank you very much. And you get to be the first British narrator I've ever had on the podcast. So oh. breaking barriers oh. today. Oh my goodness! Oh, that's that's oh, that's a, that's a real honour. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's interesting. I think I think audio books catching up now with in the US. We make fewer than you do over there, and there are fewer listeners. But I do think that they're growing incredibly fast over here, as they are in the States. Um, but I do get the feeling that we're lagging behind slightly. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I've always wondered about that. We always hear about how audiobooks are uh, doing in the U.S., and they've been growing uh, tremendously over the past five or six years or so. And I've always wondered how things uh, were and how they were taking hold in the U.K., so I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, I think it's it's a different... I think the industry has come from a different place in the UK, really. Um, I mean, I recorded, I think I probably recorded the first audio books. I did a series of them in the early 1980s. Um, and it was a series of, I did, a, I, oh, it's so long ago, I can hardly remember them. And I think it was the Grimm's Fairy Tales and a selection of Grimm's Fairy Tales, a selection of Aesop's Fables, a selection of Bible stories and a selection of um, Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare stories, but kind of slightly rewritten for a younger audience. And I recorded those in, I think it was probably about 1982, 1983. And then there was a huge gap because I was doing other things and I didn't have time to do audiobooks anymore. And of course, thankfully, those ones that I did all those years ago have disappeared completely from view, thank God, because I'm sure they were terrible. But I think as far as audiobooks in the UK are concerned, the majority of audiobook readers here come, certainly up until about three or four years ago, came from a theatre background. And 99% of audiobooks were at that point recorded in professional studios. There was no, certainly no home studios hitting the mainstream anyway. And then NACX wasn't available in the UK. You know, the audiobook creation exchange that's run by Audible. That wasn't available here either until nine, uh, 2014. 
So anybody in the UK who wanted to record or who was approached by an author to record directly a new work had to find a partner in the US who would act as producer for them because ACX was not available in the UK. Um, and I, at that point, I'd been made redundant. I worked for ITV as a series, as a television producer for 20 odd years, making documentary programs. My career is long and very convoluted. I mean, it's 50 years long, so I've done an awful lot of things, all, all involved with either interpreting other people's words or helping other people to interpret them. Or It's always been creative. Um, but I worked for a long time in ITV as a, as a program maker. When I took redundancy from that, I thought, well, what am I going to do? I'll go back to acting again. Um, and that was fine. I did bits of, um, I made a couple of films and I worked in theatre and I worked as a, theater, a producer in theatre. And I thought, this is not working really. There isn't enough work generated from those to keep me going, to keep me busy. And it was just when home studios were beginning to get set up in the UK. So I set up at home and then found a partner in the US who was prepared to work with me so that I could record a couple of titles on ACX, which I did using using this production house in the US as a partner. And then on the back of that, I started applying directly to US-based publishers, um, production houses, and started working for B-Audio and it's gone on from there, really. And that was in 2013, I think. And now I'm more or less full time working in audiobooks. But I'm still a rarity because the majority of people working full time as audiobook narrators for publishers, I don't really do ACX stuff anymore. I haven't got time. I'm too busy. Are not working in home studios. They're working in professional studios and very often are being cast by agents and casting directors. So I'm a bit of a, not a rarity exactly, but I would say that in the UK, still the majority of audiobooks outside ACX, of, of production house or published audiobooks of established authors are recorded in studios with a casting director, a producer and an engineer, rather than somebody working independently at home. So, but it is changing. It's it's slowly, slowly, um, it's beginning to change. This is very a uh, US centric podcast in terms of where our listeners come from but they have an interest in knowing how things are like in other parts of the world and you know uh, comparing the uh, p- proliferation of audiobooks and audiobook recording in the United States to uh, other parts of the world it's interesting because for the first I visited I was at APAC this year the audio publishers association conference in New York it was my first visit to New York and it was my first visit to APAC and what's so noticeable is that there is this huge community in America, many of whom I now feel I know because of contact through social media and through through talking to people on Facebook and Skype and through getting to know other narrators who work for B Audio and other production companies in the US. So I've got a whole kind of network of people that I feel I know that I'd never met. And it was including the guy who first got me into ACX. Um, who I met for the first time after having worked with him on three titles five, four, four, three, four years ago. So that was really good. But what's interesting is that huge community of people and the amount of support and knowledge and shared information that that group of people offer to each other. And it, I mean, obviously there's a, an element, you know, people people are not competing directly against each other. And I don't think we ever are, because each voice is unique. And if if you're right for a book and if you're cast as a book, it's because of who you are. And nobody else would do it in the same way. So it's like any other audition, if you're auditioning for a, a, a role in the theatre. It's always so subjective. The person who's making the decision as to whether you you or somebody else is cast in it. Um, it's, it's always very subjective. So I never think of it as being in competition with somebody else. But I think there is an element of support and community within the audiobook community in America 
that isn't quite as strong here yet, although there are organizations and there are people beavering away in the background, building those networks, and that is actually beginning now to, to grow. But it is, it, it's, it's so huge in America that for for me visiting from the uk it was it was mind boggling the number of books that are produced the number of narrators there are the different backgrounds that all these narrators are coming from you know f- some from theater some from the technical side of things some from journalism some from radio there are auctioneers there are there are all all sorts of people and in the uk it's a slightly uh, largely it's a slightly narrower field. And certainly in terms of the, the, the kudos books, if you like, almost all of them are read by actors or somebody with an acting background. You know, you think of Stephen Fry, Miranda Richardson, Judy Dench, the big names of, of audio books here. They're almost all well-known actors before they start reading. And I think what's interesting is that that isn't the case in the States. There are people coming from a much broader base than there are in the UK. But most of the books that I do here in the UK are written, or a lot of the books that I do here in the UK, are written by American authors for an American audience, but are set in the UK. So they want a British voice, but the publishing is and the production is all done in America. Very interesting. It's a weird mixture. We live in interesting times, I will say that. Um, yeah, we do. And we have had several guests on the show that are audiobook narrators and they've all pretty much said the same thing that you have about the audiobook narration community and how encouraging it is how welcoming it is how people are willing to offer tips and suggestions and advice and things of that nature so i love hearing that because i think it helps to boost the quality of the industry overall if everybody helps everybody else improve it it gives each you know what i mean like you raise everybody's game that makes it easier for an audience to find quality narration in their readings because yeah. then yeah. on the other end the narrators are helping them uh, each other out in that regard yeah and and it's not just it's it's also the technical quality of things is is so good because everybody has you know you we all use different software we use different recording techniques we use we do th- things in slightly different ways but you go onto any of the forums the, the professional audiobook narration forums on facebook or on twitter and you ask a question i'm having dropout or i'm i'm getting glitches in my audio what do i do and all this information is given, you know, there is always somebody there to answer your question. And that raises the standard. It means that, you know, you, it enables everybody to access information that would only previously, prior to the pr- proliferation of the Internet and the social media, you'd, you'd have had to go to the library or find a book or find a, a technical guru who could come and help you. Um, but that information is all there and it all helps to raise standards, which is great because it means that the audience, the listener, is getting a better quality product at the end of the day. And if you get something that you enjoy, that you like listening to, um, that's well made and well performed and is technically clean, you'll go back and listen to something else. Whereas if you get something that's full of horrible noises and glitches and crackles and doesn't sound good and, and the performance by the narrator or the actor, whatever you want to call them, um, is not up to scratch, then it could put you off for life. So I think it's really anything that raises the bar and raises the quality and raises the standard for both the listener and the performer is absolutely fantastic. I want to go back because I wanted to get a little bit of your background before uh, you started doing audiobooks full time. You talked a little bit about your uh, television work, but I want you to tell the listeners a little bit about your general background and your acting background because you've been acting for quite a while. Yes, yes, I have indeed. Um, That's my well, diplomatic I, phrasing, by yes, the way. Yes, thank you so much. That's most kind of you. <laughs> um, well, I, I suppose I went to my first ever visit to the theater. I can remember it really clearly. I was probably four or five, and it was to see um, Peter Pan, 
and it was one Christmas. And the the stars in it were Julia Lockwood playing Peter Pan and Alistair Sim, who was the most wonderful character actor playing Captain Hook. I mean, you might be familiar with him if anybody in the States ever watched the, the Centrinian series, because he was, he was often involved in those. He, he was a Scottish, doer Scottish actor. Anyway, I went to see that at the age of four or five and I came out of the theatre and I turned to my mother and I said, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. <laughs> and she wrung her hands in despair slightly and went, Oh, yes, dear. Okay, fine thinking I'd grow out of it, and I didn't. And I auditioned for drama school and went to drama school when I was 18. Um, I got a scholarship to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London, and I studied there for two years, which was the full-time acting course in those days, and graduated with the equivalent of a Master of Arts, I suppose, um, although at that point it wasn't actually counted as a degree course. And I went straight into the theatre. Um, I got a job at the Nottingham Playhouse, which was one of the premier repertory theatres in the UK. I mean, I was working with, oh, luminary directors like Jonathan Miller, actors like Michael Horden. It was phenomenal. It was the most extraordinary experience of my life. And that was my first job. Um, my career has gone downhill somewhat since then. <laughs> but no, 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 I'm joking. But we, and I, we were so lucky because at that point, the repertory system in the UK meant that virtually every town had a producing theatre. And I was, I just went from one job to the other. I went from there, I toured to the National Theatre, I played at the Edinburgh Festival. I was doing, I mean, small roles and acting ASM, you know, spear carrying or the late, the female equivalent of spear carrying, um, ladies in waiting, understudying major roles and playing small parts. But I learnt an enormous amount from doing that because you see the best. You see the best people doing it night after night, and you learn so much from doing that. And then I went on and I worked in Leicester and Birmingham and all over the place. I mean, literally from the north of Scotland right down to the south coast. And I think in the first 10 years of my acting career, I was probably only out of work, resting for about four weeks. And it was in the most amazing time to be able to work in theatre because you could go, you, generally you were hired for a season. So you would do maybe 12, 13 plays over a, a period. Each one would run for two to three weeks and you'd be rehearsing one play during the day and then playing another, a different play in the evening. And then that season would come to an end and you'd then go and do a round of auditions over the summer or over the autumn before for the Christmas shows. And then you'd go and do another season. So I just went from one job to the next, to the next, to the next. I was incredibly lucky. And I was doing everything from, you know, the, the classics, Strindberg, Ibsen, through Agatha Christie's and comedies, Alan Akebourne, to pantomime. Um, I was renowned as a principal boy in those days. You know, th thigh boots and... <laughs> And uh, thigh slapping and all that stuff. You don't do pantomime in the US, do you really? Um, but the tradition is, is that the male lead, so Prince Charming and the, um, the dame, in other words, Widow Twanky or the hero's, the heroine's mother is always played by a man. So it's a very strange, it's a very strange thing. It's great fun, but it's, it's a very odd, very British thing. So anyway, I did everything from Shakespeare to pantomime. And then I was in, the Mousetrap, which is the longest running Agatha Christie will play of any kind, of its kind, in the world. I was in year 29 of The Mousetrap. It opened in 1953. I was in year 29, and I think it's probably on year 65 now, and it's still going. So that was the most extraordinary thing to do, to be part of that for a year. And while I was doing that, I saw an advertisement in the stage which is the trade newspaper, saying that there was a new television station opening in the Midlands and I and my new husband, because by then I'd got married, um, were living in the Midlands and they were looking for television presenters. So I thought, oh, well, I might as well audition. I, well, there's no, nothing to lose, but it would be quite nice to stay at home for a bit and 
because w my husband and I met in the theatre and we both worked in the theatre. So essentially the only time we ever saw each other was either when we were out of work or at weekends. One of us might be working in Scotland, the other was working in Southampton, for example, which is the whole length of the UK apart. So um, it was a it was a very odd beginning to a marriage, really. Um, I think it was a great, very successful beginning to a marriage because we're still together 38 nearly 40 years later so but anyway that was how it started and I saw this advertisement for a job in television as a presenter and I applied for it and much to my surprise I got it but so I thought my god here I am I'm a television presenter and a continuity announcer so there was a whole other new string to my bow going on at that point and I was still doing bits and bobs of theatre I still managed to do a couple of plays here and there but then eventually it just got too much and I decided that I, you know, if I was going, I'd had to make a choice. I had to decide between one or the other. And I decided to stay with television because for a start, the pay was a downside better. Um, and then I discovered that we were going to have a baby. So obviously being in television rather than touring in theatre was a good idea. So we had our son, um, Joseph, and I was still working in television. And then I suppose about four years later, yes, he was about four, um, somebody in a different department went on maternity leave and there was a job came up uh, as a maternity cover, as a researcher. Um, and I thought, hmm, I quite fancy this because being a television presenter was fun and I enjoyed it enormously. But it was actually, particularly as one was getting older by that time, I was by then well into my 30s, was getting more and more of a difficulty to stay looking glamorous, if you see what I mean. Um, and they were very much into, it was the 80s and everybody had to look glamorous. And I got fed up with having letters from people saying, you wore that blouse four days ago. And I'd be thinking, oh, for goodness sake, do I really need to worry about what I'm wearing all the time? So anyway, and also they were getting, they wanted younger people. They were looking for younger images at the television station. And I was already feeling that I was probably a bit long in the tooth to be doing that. So I was very lucky and went over to the production side of things and found to my surprise that I was actually quite good at it. And so I got moved sideways and I started making programs and producing things and directing things and learned to work in a studio and learned to edit and learnt to self-operate a camera as a second camera and to be do a, bits of sound engineering and stuff. And eventually got made a staff producer. So I was working for the regional bit, the factual programmes bit of ITV, which is the one of the major broadcasters in the UK, for the Midlands region. I did that until, well, I did it for... 17 years, I think. And then eventually redundancy beckoned and I volunteered for redundancy and then got back into doing voiceovers again, really. Um, I'd done voiceovers all the way through the time as a presenter because obviously my voice had got heard and people were asking me to do training films and corporate stuff and then I'd start doing bits of commercials and things. So I was doing quite a lot of voiceover work and that was when I did the first audio books. And I thought when I got redundancy... I don't really want to go off touring in theatre again. It's far too exhausting. And I was feeling that, you know, I really wanted to be at home. I, I wasn't used to being off and living in digs again and, and all that discomfort that goes along with that sometimes. So I decided to set up at home and started doing audiobooks, started doing voiceovers full time, did bits of acting, as I said. But then audiobooks seemed to me to be the perfect mixture of the skills that I'd acquired. I was still acting because 99%, well, all audiobooks is about acting. As far as I'm concerned, you're being, you're bringing somebody else's words to life. You're creating the characters within the book and you are performing to somebody in a very intimate way, but nonetheless, you're still performing. So my skills as an actor came into that. My skills as a producer came into that because a lot of the time you're working solo, you're working independently, and I knew what things should sound like, having edited audio and, and video as well. I knew what things should be like. So I was kind of tying all of those skills that I'd picked up along the way in a career spanning almost 50 years and 
putting them together. So it was a perfect, wonderful solution to a question of what am I going to do next? And it was audiobooks. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm still doing them and thoroughly enjoying every moment of it. Oh, Daisy, how could you? You really are the limit. You're quite impossible. Impossible? Why? What have I done? She busily adjusted the tiny lever on her hearing aid. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't want to waste your sweetness on the desert air. Honestly, Marsha appealed to Dan. Can't you say something? I must admit, Daisy, I think it isn't very considerate of you to suddenly spring it on poor Marsha like this. Dear heaven, said Daisy, it's only Friday night. They won't be here till Sunday. How much notice does she need? Six months and a printed invitation? And I thought this was my home. Aren't I free then to ask my friends to come and see me in it? You know I always do the weekend shopping on a Friday. What was that? I always do the weekend shopping on a Friday. I'm only surprised you don't do it on a Monday and have done with it. Then you'd have all day Sunday to plan for it and write out your shopping list. Well, I tell you, I just couldn't bear to live my life in the muddle you live yours. Besides, you don't even know what they like to eat. Does this man from Persia eat normal food, for instance? I don't suppose it even occurred to you to ask. And what about all the extra expense? Is the housekeeping simply meant to stretch? I intend to do all the shopping myself and to pay for it, said Daisy grandly. I assumed you'd both take that for granted. What will it matter if I have to do without a few little things for the time being? Unimportant things like cough lozenges or aspirin or the batteries for this infernal aid. Simple act of Christian charity to homesick strangers in a wintry land. I didn't know that Marsha would carry on as though I'd landed her with the feeding of the 5,000. The nice thing about audiobook narration, you don't have to worry as much about your wardrobe choices. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, being in front of the camera live day after day was an absolute nightmare because you'd have, you know, you'd have something that you thought was a really nice top and you'd wear it on television and it would look dreadful because things don't always work. You know, something can look nice in life, but not work on television. And of course, there were all the rules about spots, stripes, checks, anything that flared. You know, you had to be really careful about what you wore because some things just didn't work. And it was just, you know, I by that time, I'd got a, a baby and trying to get myself organized, get him organized because my husband and I shared childcare. So I'd have to get him organized. Then I'd have to get to work into makeup. And, you know, I'd have baby milk over one shoulder and they'd have to say, oh, God, no, you need to wear something else. Or my hair would be a mess because I'd, he'd had a bad night and I'd been up all night and I'd got bags under my eyes and the, the makeup girl would have to spend hours trying to get rid of those. So it was quite the last thing I had time to think about, really, or was interested in thinking about was when I last wore this dratted jumper. And then there'd be a message on the duty log saying there's been a telephone call. Apparently, Helen wore that jumper last week. Well, yes, but how many jumpers do you think I've got? I've only got half a dozen jumpers. It was it was I found that really, really stressful having to think about what I was wearing all the time. I don't think I naturally am a, I'm not a clothes source in any shape or form. And I found it, I think that was probably about the most difficult part of the job because there was no wardrobe department to look after. You see in theatre, you've got, you've got a costume, you walk in, you put the costume on and you can turn up wearing anything you want. But once, you know, you're given a costume, but that wasn't the case. There was no wardrobe department to look after my clothes or launder them or anything else. It was all down to me, and it I did find that really difficult. So clothing choices as a narrator is absolutely wonderful. I love it. I can sit here in my scruffs. In fact, I don't have proper clothes anymore. I only have pajamas. We talked a little bit about you getting into uh, audiobooks, and you mentioned doing a few just randomly in the 80s but like in 2013 when you really got into it proper like um how familiar with them were you was was it that 
you had had you listened to any like or anything like that <laughs> Not not audiobooks as such. I wasn't really aware of them. And because at that point, Audible was not really established, you know, downloading them, having the software and the ability to download a book off the Internet was still really quite new. And I used to go to the library occasionally and get CDs because that was that was the way that I thought you listened to them. I wasn't really aware of all of downloading stuff at that point, even though there was the internet and all the rest of it. It wasn't, you know, it was still on dial up and that took forever and a day. So, you know, there was no broadband or anything. So sort of streaming something really in my head, certainly where we lived was not really an option. So I was aware of audiobooks from seeing them in the library and also for talking books, um, for, for I, I you have something similar over there that people still viewed audiobooks as something that were done for people who were partially sighted and there's a scheme called the talking newspaper scheme here that I'd done some work for um I'd been a volunteer with for a while and also the 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 um talking books for the for the blind or partially sighted I'd done some of that but that was kind of separate and uh, but I do listen to what I suppose in America you'd call talk radio an awful lot, um, BBC Radio 4, which which always has things like a book at bedtime and the afternoon story and the lunchtime story and the serial. So I would listen to what were essentially audiobooks in a different, slightly different format via a different platform. So I was aware of them, but not not really about the depth and breadth of them you know that there were so many and that and then i discovered that gosh you just join something called audible and they're all there and you download them and that was a revelation that when i first started out in 2013 i really wasn't aware of it wasn't something that had entered my perception you know i read i read for pleasure but i certainly other than on the radio i really wasn't listening for pleasure at that time when you decided to do them as a vocation did you you know you said you were working with someone in the u.s but did you get a lot of did you seek out a lot of advice or did you get a lot of advice from people who were already narrating audiobooks or did you just try to uh, translate your own acting experience into your first audiobook I I didn't really I mean I was working it, the guy is called Paul Heitch he's a lovely guy um and he runs yes, I'm familiar with him You know Paul well he's a really nice guy um and he reached out to to me and a couple of other British narrators because he'd come across titles on ACX that needed British voices and he asked if we'd like to audition for him and we did and he he then chose me and a couple of other people to read these british books british set books so i, I mean i asked his advice uh, because he was kind of pro he was acting as producer on those things but i didn't i didn't well i didn't know really about the forums that there were because to me, it was all new at that point. You know, as I say, the books I'd done in the 80s had long since disappeared off the face of the earth. You know, they were recorded onto tape and then transferred onto cassettes. So it was a completely different genre, really, from the way that they are now. So I asked Paul adv Paul's advice, um, but really I just relied on my instincts and on, on the skills that I'd learned. And it was only when, you know, I mean, I obviously knew I'd done radio, I'd done radio drama. So I knew about using a microphone. Uh, I knew how to, I knew how to use a microphone. I knew about not waving your arms about, not clunking, not making noises, not sitting on a creaky chair, not wearing rustly clothes. So a lot of the basic stuff I was aware of from my former life, as it were. And I asked Paul, Paul's advice, but I didn't really go into asking other people until I started improving my setup at home because at that point I was recording on fairly basic equipment and I didn't know about punch and roll and I didn't know about audio editing in any detail. Paul dealt with all of that sort of thing. So I learned an awful lot by talking to him through that process about what he needed from me. And that was, I suppose, the biggest step that I took. And then once I auditioned and was successful in being taken on as a narrator for B Audio, they have a f incredibly thorough training for 
narrators one to one training with an with a, a person who's already involved with them so i learned an awful lot from that you know all the technical side of things what what kind of quality of audio that they needed their engineers get back to you and they help you set up your studio and all the rest of it so that was a that was a really steep learning curve because it turned out that the equipment that i'd got wasn't really up to the spec that they required so i had to go out and buy stuff and get a better microphone and a, a better interface and then they told me about punch and roll rather than using a you know rather than stopping and then recording if you make an error you stop and record another bit immediately afterwards and then you have to go back and edit it with punch and roll you just record over the error so that by the time you get to the end of a chapter in theory there should be no errors at all so they taught me about all of that so working with paul and working with the lovely lady who trained me at b audio and their engineers really tied everything in together so that i felt that at the end of that i was confident to record and self produce something not self produce it because you're not i was never doing the proofing and the editing at the end of it at that stage that was all done by b audio in house but i did feel that i learned an awful lot and it was only after that really that i realized that there was this huge network on facebook and twitter and other things i in fact i don't even think i was on facebook at that point i think i joined facebook around the same time as i joined b and realized that this this you know there was just this whole community there to help me and support me and give information and i'm immensely grateful for all the people that that helped me along the way because you know without them i wouldn't be where i am now and to sort of bring this full circle to a previous episode uh, one of the things that you've mentioned to me is that you've been working with one of our previous guests, Sean Pratt. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes, I became aware of Sean through there's an organization in the UK and well and in the US. It's now a sort of worldwide organization called the VoiceOver Network. And at that point, I wasn't a member of the VoiceOver Network, but I'd done some work with them. Um, I'd done a, a, a an evening they did an evening talk. So I got emails from them about things that were happening. And I saw that this webinar was being run with Sean about nonfiction narration. And I'd done bits and bobs of nonfiction, but I'd always been aware that it wasn't an area that I was particularly comfortable with. It's, it's weird because there's a, there's a kind of thing that a lot of people, and I now know I was one of them, fall into when they're reading nonfiction of becoming almost journalistic about it. That, you start reading it in a different way. You start reading it. The temptation is to read it like a newspaper article. And it therefore loses its vibrancy and its vitality and can become very much like reading a, almost, re, almost reading a telephone directory. It becomes purely factual and it, it doesn't therefore engage the listener in the way that it should. So I did this webinar with, with Sean and it was, it was a revelation. It was just fantastic because he gave me so many tools that I hadn't know I'd known I'd got to be able to read nonfiction and approach nonfiction in a way that was truthful to the author. So able to still interpreting the, the author's intentions, but in a way that gave it a life and a vibrancy that I hadn't previously understood how to do. As soon as the webinar was finished, I said to him, do you take, you know, can I sign up with you, please? I'd like to, I'd like to work with you in more detail. And I'm now, I've now done six Skype sessions with him. And I think I've probably got about another six based on his, on his normal progress. And it's been absolutely fantastic. It's been so useful and it's helped not only with nonfiction stuff, but it's helped. It's, it's given me a lot of, skills and ability to go through a script in a way that is far more almost surgical you know if you sometimes you come across a script a, a book a text a manuscript that doesn't that you you're really struggling with it the sentences are too long the phrasing doesn't quite sit comfortably with you and you can really struggle to bring texts like that to life because they're written 
perhaps to be read rather than to be spoken. Not all books translate as easily as others to audiobooks, particularly when you look at the classics. Um, some of the older books that I've read have incredibly long, complex sentences. And it's really difficult sometimes when you're reading them aloud to actually get the sense and the author's intention of those long, long phrases, very complex phrases. And working with Paul has really helped me to dissect phrasing and sentences and a manuscript in a way that I wasn't really aware of how to do. Sometimes you do it automatically if if you connect instantly with the text. Sometimes you connect with it automatically if if it's a text that resonates with you. But but obviously when you're reading an audio book, not all not everything does resonate you with you in quite the same way. You know, some books are come to you much more easily than others. And working with Sean has really it's, well, A, a I've gained a lot of confidence, um, but B, he's also given me tools to be able to work on a text in a way that I hadn't got previously. I'm really enjoying working with him. He's an inspirational teacher, and I'm learning an awful lot, thoroughly enjoying it. And I've also done, since I started working with him, I've done two really nice non-fiction books that I would have felt not quite as confident about doing beforehand so I'm immensely grateful for that and he's a lovely guy he's a really nice chap he's one of the people that I knew on on in the ether as it were uh, who I met at the APAC conference in New York in May and it was just so nice to be able to meet him and say hello and I've been working with you for weeks but it's really nice to meet you. He was a tremendous guest on the podcast. When you told me that you worked with him, I was very eager to do this interview because my listeners got to hear from the coach's perspective when he was on. And it's good now that they are able to hear a little bit from the student end with your talking about what it's like to do those sessions and the things that you've learned from him. Yeah. So it goes full circle. So... Here's a question that I ask uh, narrators from time to time based on an article that I saw a few months ago and based on my own personal um, experiences. And you've done a lot of television work as well, so you obviously have had you know, this experience, you know, for a long, long time. But I always want to ask this question anyway, because it fascinates me. Did it take you any length of time or effort to get comfortable with hearing your voice played back on tape? Because lots of people hear themselves in their head and then hear themselves on tape and it does not compute and I'm one of those people for whom I have to convince myself that it's really me talking when I hear myself <laughs> on tape and uh, Audible through their Audible Range magazine had an article about that not too long ago and yeah. so I've been fascinated as, as to that question did it take you a while to get used to hearing your voice on tape? Well, it's it's gone on for so long for me that I think I've probably forgotten my initial reaction. I mean, you have to remember that I was that I did radio plays, uh, radio drama way back in the in the 1970s. And of course, that's you know, when I know you're playing a character and that was slightly odd hearing myself for the first time. But I'd also done a lot of radio training when I was at drama school because microphone technique and all of that was part of it. So I I'd, I'd, I suppose over the whole of my career, I've got used to hearing myself and have always listened to myself. What I did find really difficult was seeing myself on television. I absolutely hated that. I loathed it and I still hate it. I mean, there are still bits of video and there's a, as I say, I did a couple of films a few years ago and I absolutely hate seeing myself. But listening to myself, seeing myself was something very unpleasant. But no, I, I, I don't find hearing me because I think very often I'd now, particularly, I listen to myself with a far more critical ear than I used to through 
through learning, through audiobooks. I mean, I do kind of listen to myself and think, no, no, that isn't right. You need to go back and do that again. That, that was, you know, I kind of have a producer's hat on in one ear and a narrator's hat on in the other ear. So I'm quite used to listening to myself. That isn't a shock, but watching myself was horrendous. I hated it. It was very funny. This, when my son was a baby, we suddenly, he was about two, I suppose. And the television company that I worked for, rather than doing everything live suddenly started recording things and suddenly I appeared on the television and he looked at the television and he looked at me and he just screamed and I wasn't surprised it must have been really really weird for him to see me being in two places at once I think it was probably one of the most traumatic traumatic experiences of his childhood poor child oh it must have been horrible for him I mean it was pretty freaky for me but it it must have been really, really unpleasant for him. Two mummies. Oh, scary. So what is your preparation process like when you get a new audio book to do? What do you do before you even start narrating? Well, obviously, read the whole book. And you have, I just think you have to. I mean, I've, there are all sorts of horrible stories about people who don't have the time or, or think that they don't, you know, they can they can wing it. And... You know, you, there are awful stories about you give your hero an Irish accent and then in chapter 57, it suddenly is revealed that he comes from outer Mongolia or somewhere, you know, and you just can't risk it. So I do. I, I always I, what I do is I whenever I have a book, I have it on my either on my tablet. You know, my I don't have an iPad. I'm afraid Apple things are far too expensive in the UK. So I have a uh, an Android tablet. So I either have the book on my tablet or on my Kindle. And I will read the next book that I'm narrating in bed. I read for at least an hour in bed every night, no matter when I finish work. And I'll make notes on that while I'm reading another book in the daytime while I'm narrating. So I do my prep in bed, basically. And I'll read the book through thoroughly. I'll make notes and underline and annotate the text so that things like, you know, who's related to who, because if somebody's related, they may have similar speech patterns or they may have a similar accent, um, even though they they sound, they need to sound different. They, there needs to be something that links them as being related. I'll make a note of any um, pronunciations, complicated words, foreign words. I'll do research online for accents. If I know a friend or know somebody who comes from somewhere where the uh, one of the characters lives, I might give them a ring and say, can you just record a bit of dialect for me, please? So I've got the real thing to go by. I did a, I did a book set in, well, I've done two books, funnily enough, three now, set in Bosnia. And I've amazingly have a Bosnian friend which is just extraordinary and she's been really amazingly helpful on all three of those books because she's given me place names and pronunciations and bits of Bosnian that were in the books so I, I do all of that and, and read the entire book and then I start recording and I think as far as the different characters are concerned unless there's anything specific that I need to know about them like the book I'm reading at the moment, one of the characters has a slight stammer, which is always difficult because you you need to be able to indicate the stammer without it making without it sounding odd. I've done one book where one of the characters had a speech impediment so severe that nobody could understand what they were saying. Well, that's not really feasible to do in those terms. So you have to find a way of giving the impression of a speech impediment while still giving the listener the ability to understand what's being said. That was really difficult. That What I ended doing was sticking two fingers in my mouth so that I talked like this. So it was clear to the listener that it was also clear that there was something wrong with that person's voice. So it was, you know, things like that are just weird occasionally, but you just have to do them. So I read it carefully. I make notes I don't overthink it because I think that very often my instincts about it are correct. When I start recording, as soon as I come across a character and I've decided I've read their first little section, I'll go back on it and just double check on that and think, 
you know, does it sound right? Do they sound the right age? Is the accent right? Also, is there anybody, is there anything that anybody else says about them? So does anybody say they're, they've got a thin voice or a, a loud voice or a jolly voice or a, um, a mean voice in the text that I, because obviously very often there are clues in the rest of the text. Also, I think, you know, the, the physical description of somebody, if somebody's very thin and uptight, it will change the way their voice sounds. Or if someone is big and expansive and jolly, their voice will sound different. So all of those things I kind of make a note of when I'm reading. And then I just double check that the voice that I've, my instinct has given me fits with all of that. And if it does, then I keep a little clip of it so that throughout the book I have a little mp3 of all the character voices because sometimes a, um, a voice, you know, uh, somebody may appear in chapter one and not appear again for another ten chapters. Well, I don't want to have to stop and go back and trawl through all of those chapters to find that voice, that particular voice. So I always keep a little clip of each of the characters as I go through. Also, as I've learned, occasionally you will be asked, you'll do a book, and then a year later, the author will write another book with some of the same characters in. <laughs> and I always have a copy of what they sound like so that I can hopefully be consistent throughout a series of books. There's one author, uh, an American author, that I've now done seven books for. And all of those seven books are essentially a dynasty. It's a dynastic series. So some of the characters that were in the first book I read appear in the seventh book, but they're now the grandparents of the people that I'm reading about. But obviously I want to link those voices as much as I possibly can. So I always keep an audible, well, I keep every book that I have access to, every book that I've recorded I've got still. And I always keep the character clips, the character voices clips as well. Because you never know, they may crop up in another book six years down the line. Somebody may say, oh, I've written a sequel. Can you record it? And I need to be, if I'm still alive, I need to be able to remember what they sound like. It is it is interesting. There's, and it's surprising how often it crops up. I've, there was that book where, where somebody had a speech impediment. But I've also done a book where there were people, there were several characters with different levels of learning disability. Um, and also one with a severe physical and mental disability as well. Really difficult because you, you, you don't want to be, what's the word I want? You don't want to make assumptions about how a disability can affect somebody. But when it's an integral part of the story, which it was in the case of this book, you need to be true to the author's intentions. And it's important that that disability, impediment, whatever you want to call it, is reflected in the way you read the character, because it, it is who they are. They're not, you know, you're not making judgments about them, but you are creating them as the author intended them to be created. And therefore, it's your, I think as a narrator, it's your duty. You can't gloss over it and pretend they haven't got a disability. You have to play them truthfully as the author wrote them. And that was, it was something I toyed with long and hard because you don't want to be you don't want to appear critical. You don't want to appear that you're taking the mickey out of people with a disability, for example. You don't want to appear that you're you're being cruel or hurtful towards that disability. It was, it was there were two characters with Down syndrome in one book, and but you had to be truthful to what the author intended, and that was that those characters had this disability. So it was. It was difficult. It was something that I toyed with long and hard. And the author did get back to me afterwards, after I wrote, after I completed the book. The, the, the author who wrote the book got back to me and said, and thanked me for handling the disabilities within the book so sensitively and so carefully. So I felt a huge sense of relief about that, that I hadn't, I'd been truthful to her intentions and hadn't been, you know, I hadn't either taken it too far or not taken it far enough that I'd, I'd interpreted her intentions correctly. And that was, that was good to hear. It was good to know. Etiquette dictated that a gentleman caller did not extend his visit beyond 15 minutes. So it was that Miss Minerva Dodger knew that her time in the company of Lord Sheridan would be drawing to a close within the next 180 interminable seconds. 
this visit was his third within the past seven days, and all she'd really garnered from their time together was that he used a little too much bergamot cologne, kept his fingernails well manicured, and that he cleared his throat to signal the end of his calling upon her. She now welcomed the harsh gurgle as he set aside his cup before standing. Thank you so much for coming, Lord Sheridan. I hope I may call on you tomorrow. If I may be so bold, my lord, allow me to ask if this is truly how you want to spend the remainder of your life. Pardon? We are not suited, my lord. I'm not certain how you've reached that conclusion. We don't converse. I've tried to engage you in several topics of conversation. On the wisdom of England's expansion in Africa. It's not a subject that should concern a lady. It is going to concern a great many ladies if war erupts and they find themselves catapulted into widowhood. She held up her hand. My apologies. You didn't want to discuss it earlier, and I'm quite certain you don't wish to now. It's simply that I have opinions and believe I have the right to voice them. You will be a countess. What has that to do with anything? You will be Lady Sheridan. I have a very large estate, Miss Dodger. Granted, it does need some upkeep, but your dowry will set it to rights. And there it was, spoken at long last, the reason for his presence in her parlour. And you talk about that on your website a little bit. There's a section dedicated to your audiobooks, and you have a little subheading under that section. And you were talking about how, you know, an author will have this manuscript for, uh, you know, months and months and months, and they get this oral painting in their minds. Mm. And then, you know, they turn it over to you, a complete stranger, and then you have to sort of, you know, do what you can to sort of do your best to achieve that oral mm. painting that they've had in their head for so long. And you compared it to minding a child. Yes, yes. It is, it is. It's like they've handed over their baby to a child minder for a sort of, for a, for a summer holiday. You know, they, they hand it over for two weeks or, or however long, months, whatever. You know, it's like sending a baby to boarding school and, and then you get it back and it's wearing different clothes or, it, you know, is it, it's behaving differently. It's learned something different along the way. And the parent has to take it back and, and find it again somehow. There's, you know, do they still recognize it? Is it still their baby? Yes, of course it's still their baby, but it's their baby in maybe different clothes or that's learnt something that it didn't know when it left them. So it's, it is, it's such an honor when an author gives you their work that they've spent years working on and got all these voices in their head and you're there to interpret it. It's a huge responsibility and I'm sure we don't always get it right. I'm sure there are times when an author will go, oh my God, no, he really shouldn't sound like that. But it's, you know, the, the trust they choose at the end of the day, it's always almost always the author who's choosing you to do it. And once it's handed over, you just have to do your best to be true to what their intentions are, what you see their intentions are. But they have handed it over. An author can't micromanage an audiobook once, once you're doing it. Once that step has been made and an author has given you the book to read, then you have to read it. And it can't, I, I think the, I believe that the emphasis then changes to your interpretation. You're making that book your book in the audiobook version. And there has to be a point where the author trusts you to do that. And I think one of the one of the problems that arises sometimes and where things are not as successful as they might be is that that relationship, the balance of that relationship goes awry somehow. Either the narrator is seeking approval from the author constantly as, as the production process goes through, or the author is micromanaging the project as it goes through and is offering, you know, no, don't do it like that, do it like this, don't do it like that, do it like this. And then that relationship is is subtly changed. And I think that if that happens on either direction, either the narrator seeking approval or the author seeking control, then the book will 
ultimately not be as good as it could be because that element of trust between the author and the narrator has somehow broken down along the way. You mentioned the, you know, the pitfall of you might have an author said, oh, they shouldn't sound like that or whatever. But the inverse of that could also be true where you can get a comment from an author like, well, that's not how it sounded like in my head. It's better. Yes. Yes. And that. And yes, absolutely. Because I think I think. The, the whole the joy of doing audiobooks is that it's a creative process. The author has created something and you're giving that something a voice. Now, it may not be the identical voice to the one the author first heard in their head. You doing it in a different way might give the author something back that they hadn't expected to get. It's like a it's it's a wonderful it's it's a wonderful it's it's like a play. You know, a playwright will write a play for the theatre. And they'll hand it over to a director and a group of actors who will then bring it to life. And they will see something that the author hadn't even thought of in the first place. So it's, 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 they add another layer to it. It enhances it. And I think the same thing happens with audiobooks. And it's, it's great when that happens. You know, I've had comments back from authors saying, Do you know, I never even thought of that. You made it sound as though X knew about, so I'd never thought about them. That's wonderful that that happened. It's great. It's a wonderful partnership. It's a wonderful relationship. And I think that both authors and narrators involved in the process of creating an audiobook are are, are great at doing it. I think we're both learning. I think narrators are learning and I think authors are learning as well on the process because let's face it, books were originally written to be read. There was no, you know, you might read a, ch a book aloud to a child, but generally speaking, a book was a, a personal thing that you, that you read. And I think the fact that the voice can add things to a book, it can add atmosphere, it can add tension, it can add warmth and and intimacy in a way that may not have been expected i think is a wonderful thing i think it's a great i love audiobooks i love reading audio i love reading books and i love the fact that it's it's such a creative process it's hugely creative in some ways even more so than 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 stage acting because as you said you have only your voice you have to, you know, there's no expression, although you do. I mean, I pull faces and wave my arms around and sometimes I stand up and I'll, I'll, you know, stand in a different way if I'm playing somebody with the different physical features. It's, it's much more physical than I ever thought it would be when I first started. And I think that it's just immensely creative and I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be able to be doing something that I love doing after so many years and at advanced age. It's a huge honour to still be working, I have to say. For decades, we've all been counting calories, in, out, in, out, shake it all about. Be honest now, how many calorie-controlled diets have you been on in your lifetime? Me? More than I care to remember. The first was in the 1980s, when I was 18. I looked in a mirror and thought that if I was thinner, I'd look better and people might like me more. At the time, I was very influenced by all the chitter-chatter among my peers about weight loss and perfectionism. So I bought a little yellow book listing calorie counts and became such an expert that I could calculate the numbers of every meal without even looking at it anymore. Over a few months, I became thinner and thinner. At 5 feet 7 inches, I went from a healthy 132 pounds to about 112 pounds. Then, one day, I woke up and suddenly had the most insatiable hunger of my life. I couldn't stop eating and started craving junk foods I'd never eaten before. I remember being on the upstairs of a bus and turning my head to see a McDonald's. I immediately had to break my journey, get off and go in and have a big binge. I would buy a loaf of sliced white bread, a pot of jam and some margarine, and say to myself I'd just have one slice. But then I'd sit by the toaster preparing each one till the entire loaf was gone in one sitting. I gained 48 pounds and rocketed to 160 pounds, the heaviest I've ever been before or after that time. Instead of being thin, I was now officially overweight for my height. I felt permanently depressed. My skin was a mess, I caught several colds a year, and my figure was destroyed, along with any tiny piece of confidence I'd ever harboured. 
My thighs rubbed together painfully when I walked, and I lived in a long black sweater dress to hide my shape. It's so interesting, the points you've made, because I have read articles or read interviews with authors where they will talk about how their writing has now changed because they have the audiobook in mind for, you know, their their story. They they now write thinking about the fact that this is going to become an audiobook and and how it's going to sound when it becomes one. Whereas, you know, ten ten or twenty years ago, especially twenty years ago, uh, not everything was made into an audiobook and you no. didn't really have to consider that. And now it's actually impacting how and these are you know, famous and influential mm. writers that have talked about. I think Stephen King and James Patterson mm. are a couple that have talked about how how audiobooks have sort of had an influence on the way they write now. Mm. And I, 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 that's right. And I think what what is happening because now almost, I mean, almost every book seems to be available as an audiobook as well. You know, if you look, if you call up the title of a book on the internet, it'll give you different versions, you know, it's available as a hardback, as a paperback, as an ebook, and as an audiobook. And I, I'm sure that authors, it, it, that is in the back of an author's mind. And they're, they're reading things aloud for themselves, hopefully, because if you read something aloud, it, as you're writing it, you write it in a different way because you don't speak in the way that we write necessarily. And I think that I think that authors, certainly in my experience, the the books that are written more recently are very often easier to read than some of the classics because they were definitely not written to be read aloud in the same way. And that's one of the one of the big challenge when you get a book that's a classic because they don't flow. Punctuation was used differently. Sentences can be so incredibly long that you actually have to break them up because there isn't enough breath to read through to the end of the sentence. You find yourself running out. And I think, yes, I think it's wonderful that authors are prepared to take on board that the people who are narrating their books bring something to the table for them as well, because it's always it's always got to be a two way process if it possibly can be. And it's interesting because I follow a lot of people who have made their livings writing television sitcoms and things like that, and they sort of have similar comments about how they write and how you know it it has to sound like something that a person would say, <laughs> and sometimes grammar proper grammar does not sound anything like what a person would actually say and no. uh, that may drive the english teachers of the world mad but it's a reality of of life we yes we, yes know. but you, and and you know you have, you have it an author might write he had thought that so and so and so and so whereas if you're if you're saying it out loud you would say he'd thought and that's yeah what the of contraction of the language is something that you do automatically as a narrator. Unfortunately, some publishers don't allow that. They want it to be 100% accurate. So you are you are having to read what is written, even though it sounds slightly stilted. But then your job is to make it sound not stilted. Your job is to make it sound as though it's natural and flowing and conversational, even if it's terribly formal language. And also, of course, you have to you have to think of the period in which the book is set. The book I'm doing at the moment is set in between the wars, so nine, the late 1930s, and people spoke differently then. So you can't do a kind of modern, you know, if a sentence starts with so, it wouldn't be so in the way that people use the word so now at the beginning of a sentence. You have to use the language of the period. You have to act and go into the era that the book is set in so if it's if it's set in victorian times the language and the way that language is used will be different from a a, a book set in 2017 so the narrator has to always always be truthful to the period that the book is set in as well and that can make things quite interesting because not always is a book written if a book is set in the victorian era for example the writing has to also fit the victorian era you can't an author shouldn't be using modern idioms and and modern words in a book that's set 
200 years ago because those words were used in a different way. In fact, that's a particular bugbear of mine is when authors don't do their research properly and put modern words and modern contextual stuff into books that are essentially period pieces because it makes it so difficult to make it believable if something suddenly crops up that shouldn't be there, <laughs> if you see what I mean. As a listener, I, I could sometimes tell without having done any research on who the author might be, so, sometimes I can tell where they might be from yeah. based on one tiny thing. Do they say February 12th or 12th February? Yes. Because or do, yes, that is... Yes. Yes. Or do they say got or gotten? That's the other giveaway. Language is a wonderfully complicated thing. But, it certainly is. Uh, it certainly is. And I've... You know, I, I use, we, we all speak English, but we speak different English. Sometimes it can be amusing. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend from Scotland, and sometimes I think he's saying something, and he's saying something else. <laughs> and there's a little bit of a cross-up that has to be straightened out, not yes. ironed out, but we get, it, we get it fixed in the end. Really quite a fascinating look at just what, you know, are the things that, can trip a person up when they're narrating an audiobook or the things that you have to make notes of in your yes. in your prep work. I was in the honeysuckle room doling out extra bedding the day Vincent Roper returned. The most familiar of details seems so important now. The barbershop band rehearsing in our lounge, the pale yellow of the blanket the airing cupboard scents of lavender bags, copper pipes, that smell of warm wool like a pint of milk about to turn, the toll the task had taken on my back. Perhaps I was getting too old for all this. Maybe Zenka had a point when she mithered me about leaving all the housework to her. I allowed myself a breather since the honeysuckle room afforded a magnificent view of Morecambe Bay, the pigeon grey sands stretching out for miles until they reached the charcoal waves, the sky the shade of smalls gone through the dark cycle by mistake. When I spotted an elderly gentleman heading up our front path, I thought at first he might be a Frenchman. Something about the cut of his jacket, the loose coil of his scarf, the rectangular shape of his glasses... But the high polish of his cane and the way he bowed his head to the wind with an air in between defiance and defeat, these things were unmistakably English. He paused for a long while, taking in Sea View Lodge, his hand on our front gate. Perhaps he'd noticed that our masonry could do with a lick of paint or that the gutters needed repairing. When the man looked straight up at the honeysuckle room, a memory broke into my mind. A girl holding her sister above the waves, letting the water lap at the little one's toes. The child's elfin face all wonder as a wave froth caught in her curls. The scariest thing for me is, is reading a book that has American characters in it. Because I feel quite confident about doing most British accents, but... I certainly, I, I don't have a, a handle on regional American accents at all. I'm not, I'm not confident. I mean, I wouldn't be confident enough to read a book with a, with the narrative voice as an American voice. I've done a couple now that have American characters in, and that is really scary because, you know, I know that the first thing that's going to happen when anybody in America listens to that, they're going to go, Oh my God, what does she think she sounds like? <laughs> So that's really scary. But I guess it's the same thing happens for American narrators when they come across a British, you know, a, a real British person in it. I guess that's just as scary. I think even within different parts of the country, you would have debates on whether or not it was right or wrong, too, because... Absolutely. I'm just trying to imagine you trying to do a, a deep Cajun Louisiana accent for oh, you know. God, um, well I can I can kind of do on gold. You know, uh, what is it? Yes, I could bend you, Henry. I could wear you like a bracelet. That's my impersonation. <laughs> that's um, 
what's her name? Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> On Golden Pond. <laughs> yeah, it's either that or it kind of – I don't know if you're familiar with the American television show The Golden Girls, but it oh, sounds yes, very yes, much yes, like – Oh, yes, 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 yes. Sounds girls. sort of like Blanche. Yeah, yeah so. a bit like Blanche. That's that's it. That's the sub- – <laughs> I'm not doing any more American accents on this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm thankful that you just did the one. So, um, Oh, well, thank you so much. I wanted to ask you to, or give you the opportunity, rather, to get in some of your plugs for your uh, projects and your social media and things of that nature. So I'll let you go ahead and tell people how they can find you on the Internet. Okay. Well, my um, Twitter handle is Helen Lo- at Helen Lloyd Audio. My professional page on Facebook is Helen Lloyd Audio. My LinkedIn page is Helen Lloyd Audio. My website is HelenLloydAudio.com. And I'm Helen Lloyd Audio. <laughs> That's it. They're all the same. It's all under Helen Lloyd Audio. So I'd be very happy to see people on Twitter, to chat to people. Well, Helen, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. This has been a lot of fun. I actually have one other thing I wanted to ask you because sometimes Go ahead. I, Please uh, do. Sometimes I like to end these interviews by asking people uh, things that are far afield of of what we're uh, meant to be talking about, in this case, audiobooks. Okay. And I was looking at your Twitter biography. And I saw two words that absolutely thrilled me, and those words were cake maker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I make cakes. So what is your what are some of your cakes that you make? Well, I I've always my mother was a mammoth baker. You know, we had homemade cakes every weekend, and I've inherited her love of both baking and eating cakes so i bake and i think i bake ordinary cakes and we have cake fairly regularly and i also at one point in my life got myself involved with making decorate making and decorating wedding cakes because i enjoy i found it really relaxing it was a bit like doing play-doh making sugar flowers you know sugar craft flowers and doing royal icing and stuff so i've there was a period for about four years when I had it wasn't a business but word of mouth would get round or the sons and daughters of friends would say would you do our wedding cake for us and I'd all celebration cake or it's my mum's 50th birthday it was my parents golden wedding could you do a cake please and I still do I still make cakes for friends and I make sugar flowers and I enjoy doing it and I love making cakes and I love eating them too which is probably not terribly good for me but I do enjoy them And thanks again for coming on the show. If there's anything you'd like to leave our listeners with before we throw to our commercial break, I will leave the floor to you. But just to say to all of you who listen to audiobooks and are interested in audiobooks, thank you, because without all of you guys and people like Casey spreading the word about how great audiobooks are, I wouldn't have a job. And I'm very grateful. We have a winner in the September bonus giveaway of Stephen King's It audiobook. Congratulations to Craig Johnson. Craig, check in with us here at the Talking Audiobooks podcast, and we'll get you your code for Stephen King's It audiobook. Congratulations. I want to thank Helen Lloyd for coming on the show. Head on over to Audible and check out her work. That's H E L E N L L. O-Y-D, Helen Lloyd, and you can find her releases on Audible and check them out. Check out her website and Facebook and Twitter and all that fun stuff we have for you in the show notes. She's an absolutely lovely person to talk to, and it was so much fun. I have been blessed with so many good interviews. All the interviews I've done have been just outstanding And that is a contradiction to me in a sense because I think that if you say everything you do is outstanding, that's just a way of saying nothing is outstanding because you have to have a differentiation. 
But as I've done this podcast, the truth is I've enjoyed every one of the interviews that I've done, and I do think they stand out. I love doing episodes where I interview someone. There's just a different energy there. And I think what it is boils down to the fact that you have multiple people talking about things that they are passionate about, things that they are dedicated to, things that they have a vested interest in spreading the word about. Uh, Helen has a vested interest in talking about audiobooks and audiobook narration because that's how she makes her living. And I am a fan of the genre, and I do this podcast, and I want to spread the word about audiobooks for that reason as well, because I love them, and because it helps gain me an audience as a podcaster to be a strong ambassador for the audiobooks community. And so that's why I think all of our episodes with interviews have been tremendous and outstanding so far. And I hope you enjoyed this one as well. I'm going to let the interview stand on its own this week. Usually this is the time of the show where I do the caught my ear segment and talk about some audiobooks that have come out recently or some that I've listened to recently that have caught my ear or that have gotten my attention. But due to the length of the interview, because it was so good and because I really want that to stand out this week, I will forego the caught my ear segment for this week and we will bring that back next week. I want to let you all know that we have a special episode of the Talking Audiobooks podcast coming up. It's one that I'm very much looking forward to sharing with you because I think this one is a lot of fun in a different sort of way. Uh, If you listen to our 4th of July show or our Frank DeFord retrospective, this episode is framed like those. I call it audiobooks for the fall season. And when I say fall season, I don't mean fall weather-wise. I mean fall television-wise. I go through my audiobook library and I pull some excerpts and some clips out from audiobooks that I own that cover TV shows, TV personalities, some aspect of the television industry, the history of television, whatever it may be. I go through my own collection. These are all books that I own, and I pull them out, and I talk a little bit about them and why I decided to feature them. And the new fall television season will be starting in just a few days after you've heard this podcast. So we are timing that release to coincide with the fall TV season, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy listening to it. I've enjoyed those theme episodes as well in a different way that I enjoy doing the interviews. The key takeaway is that I'm having a lot of fun hosting this podcast every week, and I'm having a lot of fun hearing from you, the listeners, as to how much you've enjoyed listening to the podcast. It makes my day when I get a tweet from someone that says, hey, just found the podcast. Absolutely love it. Keep up the great work. That just does my heart good, and it makes me want to keep on moving on to the next episode, you know, because sometimes I don't have good days, and hearing compliments does a lot to lift my spirits, too. So I thank you all for that. And if you are enjoying the show, I would like to encourage you to please go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes or on your podcast subscription platform of choice that will let you leave reviews make it a good one it does help the podcast if we get a lot of five-star reviews on itunes that moves us up the rankings that tells itunes that people are listening and that they like the show and they will feature the podcast more prominently in the categories and things like that and that helps us gain a bigger audience and that only helps us in terms of the things that we are able to do with the show. Uh, A bigger audience means that we can dedicate more time to the show. We can experiment and try new things and put out more episodes and all the good things that come with a big audience. And so we thank you for checking us out. And please, please do give us a review. Leave us some positive feedback. You can also reach out to us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com with any questions, comments you may have about the show. Uh, If you 
are someone who works in the audiobook industry and you listen to the podcast and would like to be a guest, that is the email address to reach out to us at to set up a dialogue with myself and producer Ken to arrange an interview. And we would be happy to chat with you on future episodes of the Talking Audiobooks podcast. You can find our website at talkingaudiobooks.com, Facebook dot com slash talking audiobooks and twitter dot com slash talking audio be on the lookout check out our social medias because we have giveaways uh, ken has just recently done the first weekly giveaway in the podcast history and that coincides with our usual monthly giveaways and the ways to find out about those quickest are to check us out on social media because they go up right when the contest starts and so you don't have to wait for ken or i to talk about the contest on the podcast Uh, you can just follow the social media and you can enter to win some free audiobooks and who does not enjoy free stuff and i am audiobook casey that's audiobook c-a-s-e-y on facebook twitter and goodreads i'm always happy to connect with listeners of the podcast fans of audiobooks in general and have a conversation on social media that's one of my favorite parts about being able to do this podcast for you each and every week and we will be back next week with another episode of talking audiobooks and until then i want to encourage everybody to just keep listening Thanks, Casey, for another great episode of Talking Audiobooks. Talking Audiobooks is hosted by Casey Trowbridge, produced by yours truly, Ken Joy, is produced by Ken Joy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. All the music you hear on Talking Audiobooks is licensed through epidemicmusic.com. If at any time during one of the clips that we're playing from an audiobook here on the podcast, you happen to hear this... It means we've bleaked out a word that is unsuitable for the rating that this podcast carries on iTunes. It does not appear in the actual audiobook when you purchase it from Audible or another vendor. The information and opinions you hear expressed on the podcast are those of our host and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the opinions or beliefs of our sponsors. Make sure you visit the website at talkingaudiobooks.com and enter this month's giveaway. See you next time.